Okay. So welcome everybody. Thank you uh, for coming and for tuning in. Uh, we're very honored to have uh, uh, Dr. Roberta. Sorry if I call her this way, but it's the easiest way to remember. <laughs> I don't read uh, when I speak uh, very seldom, so I apologize. But you're called Roberta, so anyway, so it's definitely you. Uh, an awardee of the Nobel Peace Prize uh, in uh, 2011 from Liberia. Uh, small uh, but important, very important country in West Africa on the Atlantic coast uh, that suffered uh, from uh, a very uh, bloody and uh, uh, terrible civil war, which is uh, always a bad thing, but especially bad for small countries. And uh, uh, of course, her efforts uh, uh, to uh, produce uh, an agreement and a subsequent peace uh, uh, were recognized by the Nobel Committee. We're very pleased uh, to have her here. I explained to her the circumstances uh, end of semester, pandemic, uh, uh, much else. Uh, we haven't resumed our. Uh, in person meetings. Uh, uh, we've been uh, in remote connection for two years uh, now, over two years. So the Guarini Institute uh, has not held lectures uh, for over two years, except one last September on the terrace. But today the terrace was risky because of the weather. That is why we didn't go. And it was precisely our student Fayaz from Afghanistan, who explained to us uh, what was going on in his country. Brilliant analysis. But that's the only in present event that we've had uh, since February 18th, uh, 2020. So this is already one. It's the first event we hold in the classroom. So it's a premiere in a certain way. And uh, I would like to pass the word to. Uh, our good friend uh, Lydia Malcandro, who is uh, <coughs> responsible for the uh, coordination of Nobel Peace Prizes uh, worldwide, and organizes an annual meeting uh, of the Nobel, Nobel Peace uh, uh, Awardees, uh, which is uh, always very significant and produces uh, most interesting discussions uh, and uh, documents and commitments. Lydia? Thank you, Professor Gentieri. And yes, at the summits, we have received several students from uh, John Cabot University in the past. So I'm very honored to be here uh, once again in a, and with a new project. We are very honored to have among us a world famous leader in his activism, the women's rights advocate, Dr. Lema Bowie, or the Leila Roberta Bowie. <laughs> Dr. Bowie received the Nobel Peace Prize, as you said, in 2011 for her nonviolent efforts to further the safety of women and for women's rights to full participation in peace building work. Dr. Bowie, as you were telling us before, played a pivotal role in ending the devastating 14 year civil war in her own country, Liberia by leading a non-violent movement of Christian Muslim women. In 2012, she founded the Bowie Peace Foundation Africa, which provides educational and leadership development opportunities for girls. So we're looking forward, Lema, to receiving your lecture on this topic, the urgency of global peace in the 21st century. The floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you so much, Lydia. Thank you, Professor. And um, I'm not one who is um, excited about crowd. I have one belief that when I'm in a space, if there are two people, those were the two who were supposed to be in that space. So. <laughs> those were the two who were supposed to be in that space. So. That's um, for me. 
So the urgency for global peace in the 21st century. We are at a place in our world where everyone is yearning for peace. Um, from Afghanistan to Ukraine recently, even Russia, um, DR Congo, there are many different parts of Africa that is or that are loaded with different forms of conflict. There is a website that is called Wars in the World. And if you go to that website, you find up to date um, information on the wars that are being fought and the casualties and all of the different things. But as we talk about the urgency for peace in the 21st century, one of the things that comes to mind immediately is the question of what is peace in the world that we find ourselves in today? Most times people equate peace to any wars, stopping militarism. Over the last five years, and today is actually my last day, I started a program at Columbia University called the Women, Peace and Security Program. And we piloted that program as a means of reinterrogating the true meaning of peace or redefining peace from the perspective of women, redefining security from the perspective of women, and really trying to position it. And one of the things that we did at the beginning of that was to bring civil society organizations based in the US doing different kinds of work. to so say, let's have a conversation about what peace is and what security is. A lot of the groups, the first day came into the room and the first thing they said was, we don't fit into the, we don't see ourselves as a peace organization. We don't see ourselves as a security organization. One part, group in particular said, let's dig further into who you are and what you do. So I work with children. I work with children whose parents are incarcerated. I work with children who have seen multiple forms of violence. I work with children who cannot find food. I work with children who doesn't have a place to stay. I work with women who have been raped. I work with people who have suffered gun violence. And the more they explain, I'm like, it sounds like civil war. It sounds like a situation of internal displacement. Come on in, come on in. Come on in. It sounds like a situation of internal displacement. It sounds like a political crisis. And if all of these things that you're explaining is right, then you don't have peace. Then you're working in a peace context. And one person was like, oh, I never really saw it that way. Because the way globally peace has been defined is any militarism. So most time people tend to think that the whole conversation around global peace is for Afghanistan, it's for Africa, and places like Rome and the US have no need for peace because quote unquote, they're in a peaceful situation. And as I've moved around and done work in different parts of the world, including this country, I've come to realize that peace is not just the absence of war. Peace is the presence of conditions that dignifies all. So when you talk about human rights, the dignity of life, the dignity of responsibility, the dignity of participation, the dignity of having a home, the dignity of having a passport, all of these things are equivalent to peace. And if we, we agree with that definition, then we can't, let's rein it in into the need for global peace, the urgency for global peace. As I was reading, doing my readings for this morning, um, 
one of the things that I found out was that global peace is defined as the absence of any kind of military threat from outside the sovereign jurisdiction of a particular country. And then cooperation and understanding amongst all nations across the globe. The first question I ask myself is if this is global peace, then I would say we have very few global wars. One prominent one will be Ukraine and Russia, because that is one military group going into another sovereign nation. And then you ask yourself, so where does civil wars fit in the whole conversation of global peace? Because a vast majority of the wars that are being fought today are civil wars from Liberia to Congo to Afghanistan to Yemen to Syria. And people will say, oh, but I mean, just think about all of the places in the world that are unsafe. They don't accept maybe for Ukraine and some parts of some other parts of the world, but prominently Ukraine that everyone knows has been under attack by Russia. So if you think about all of this, it means each and every one of us, the first thing that we need to do in order to even get to global peace is to begin to reshape and redefine what global peace is in the world today. Because if we look at all of the academic definitions of global peace and it's limited to military operation against another sovereign nation, we fall short of where we find ourselves today. Because what you also need to recognize is that one civil war, as we've seen in our world today, also threatens the peace and stability of other nations. Let's take, for example, the migrant crisis in Europe today. A lot of those migrants who are risking their lives to cross the ocean are risking so because they are running away from something in their countries, not something that someone else, again, except for Ukraine and some other places, but most of the migrants, let me bring it home to Africa. Nigeria, as we see it, is one country in Africa that we can't say is at war with itself. Few pockets of places. But a vast majority of the migrants that leave from Africa are from Nigeria. Very few of them are from the North where you have the crisis. A vast majority of them are from parts of Nigeria where there's absolutely no war going on. And a lot of them are either economic migrants and in the case of women, they are running away from issues that threatens their life. So um, their sexuality, which has to do with forced marriage, female genital mutilation, and all of the different things. So I'm just laying this down and I don't know, are you all following? Am I making any sense to you all? Because I'm just laying it down so that we understand that when we're pocketing, when people talk about global peace, we should not just limit ourselves to military operations between and amongst nations. Because long before Ukraine and Russia, no one can say or could say that they have global peace, that we have global peace. The other thing that we have to look at when it comes to civil war beyond the migration um, into Europe and other parts. We have the climate migra migrants, people who are crossing borders because of lack of water, lack of food, lack of productivity of their lands. And this is also causing serious problems in different parts of the world. So the question now is, 
how do we transform a world that is loaded? And the first thing I alluded to was the whole, the redefinition of peace, the redefinition of global peace. And all of us coming to a place of understanding of what we think, feel, global peace should be. One thing that I've seen, and if you look at later on this more, this after, later on today, my intervention at the SDG conference at the foreign ministry is going to be primarily the question I'm being asked is, how can we end the same thing? Some of the conflict, but how can women contribute? And if we must put an urgency to global peace in the 21st century, the first thing that we have to do after redefining what peace is, we must center people into all of our efforts for transformation of the world. What do I mean by this? Since Ukraine and Russia is one of the biggest talking points for our time, a lot of the conversation about Ukraine and Russia has now narrowed down to one thing, nuclear weapons. People are no longer factored into it. If you go back to Afghanistan and begin to talk about the Afghanistan crisis from decades, first it was the outside countries that were influencing. Today is about the Taliban and their policies. Not much is being said about how do we center people in the, 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 the ending or in all of our intervention processes. In Liberia, in the war years, it was about the diamonds, the gold, and all of the different things. And then when we go to the peace table, it's about the egos of those men and it's about the power and position like in South Sudan today, is about who gets which rich part of the world. Go to the Niger Delta in Nigeria that is rich with oil. No one talks about a place where billions of dollars is taken out every day, but you cannot find a state-of-the-art hospital. Everyone talks about how they need to end the conflict in the Niger Delta, but no one talks about women who have to watch their babies die. So over time, a vast majority of the population of these women are addicted to codeine, mixing, mixing cough syrup with some soda to get high, to forget about the crisis. People talk about, oh, we need to take the guns from the youth. But no one talks about how just next door to these young men homes, you have high rise buildings and at night, they listen to parties of those in the corporate world. No one talks about the rape and abuse inside of peace conferences. They say it just as a political statement, but is that really a drive to end a conflict based on the sufferings of people? If any conflicts was based on the sufferings of people, Afghanistan would not be where it is today. Syria would have ended years ago. Yemen would have ended because the images from those places, hungry babies, cold people, suffering people, same with Congo. When people are factored into any process, there is a drive to end it. But what I've seen in our world today, from my experience, a lot of the conversations about transformation is hinged on who gets what. Which nation today, Ukraine is about Biden and Putin. It's not about the people who are suffering, those mothers who are losing their children on a daily basis. 
Yemen is about the Saudis and the UAE, and it's not necessarily about the Yemeni people. So until we recenter people in all of this, recently we saw one of the biggest expo in the world, the Dubai Expo. I was fortunate to have gone to the expo more than three, four times to make presentations. And one of it was with g -Stick. And we were talking about technology. And during that conversation, my take was, this is one time in the history of our world that we are so sophisticated. Our cell phones can do things that we never imagined they could do. I just sat downstairs and watched a machine make me tea. We have all of these, but we must admit that this is the one time in human history that we're miserable. The sufferings, the hunger, the poverty in the midst of increasing wealth. And if you doubt that we have not sent up people in all of what we're doing, we say we're developing this pen to write for us so that people can be free. But this pen writes for us and it draws, people, it draws us further away from our collective humanity. The second thing we need to think about, what are those global structures that are oppressive in nature? And the first one that comes to mind is the five permanent members of the Security Council of the UN. In this day and age, I think it was 2016, 15 or 17, I had the opportunity of addressing the Security Council. And in that address, I made it very clear to them that when the UN was formed, a lot of the countries who sit there today were either colonized or didn't have their independence. And there was not the kind of power within some of these countries. And so it was okay for them to have five permanent members. The world has changed, time has changed, systems and structures have changed. And it's time for the UN to dismantle the five permanent membership of the Security Council. Until we do that, the wars that we see happening will continue to happen because it will always be at the expense of one of these five permanent, or at the advantage of one of these five permanent members. So it's time for us to dismantle that one major um, oppressive structure of our world. There are many more. The last, the, the third thing or fourth thing I, I believe is to look within all of our national policies and position human security, the basic human security needs of all. I ask people in my country, Liberia, why do we have a military budget that is five times more than our education budget, our health budget, and when we do not have threats from outside. The biggest threat to security in any nation is from within. When people feel disenfranchised, when people feel that they cannot get their basic needs met, it's very easy for someone to come and coerce them to take guns and they will pick it up and fight. It's easy for them to take to the streets. It's easy for them to riot. So until our national governments begin to rethink how budgeting is done so that every home, every child can feel like whatever development is happening in this space that I call my country, I too can benefit. We stand a huge race of continuing to see the circle of violence and would push, it will push us further and further away from global peace. The politics of winner take it all needs to stop, especially in Africa where when one regime wins election, it's time for them to enrich, enrich themselves at the expense of the people. Finally, I think for global peace to become the urgency for global peace, it's time that we stop doing peace in silos. We need to really think about collaborative efforts in all of the different things that we do. First at the local level, then at the national, regional, and then international level.
But I don't believe that one conference, one group, one action can transform our world. We, we say in Africa, if you want to go far, go to, to, if you want to go far, go alone. I mean, if you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go far, go together. And I think the urgency for global peace in the 21st century is something that is calling all of us, regardless of status, regardless of creed, regardless of where our nations are positioned. This is something that we all have to do. The Italians did not wake up one day and said, we're inviting migrants from Africa. But because we all live in a global village and our collective humanity is tied, no one nation can say, I'm free if another nation is not free. I'll stop for now and I'll take questions. Thank you. This was very inspiring. Yeah. Indeed. Um, I have a question, certainly. Actually, I have multiple questions, but uh, <laughs> I'll, I'll only ask one and then uh, leave the floor to the students. Uh, my question is related to the Security Council. Uh, we know that it's devilishly difficult to change anything in the UN. Mm. Uh, the more people say the UN needs to change, the more difficult it is actually to change it. So the only change, uh, as I, Teresa, a student from Angola knows well because she's in my class currently. Uh, the only real reform, uh, the only change in the UN Charter happened uh, uh, in 1965 when uh, uh, more uh, members were admitted uh, as non permanent members of the Security Council. So non permanent members were raised from six to ten. But the B5 uh, remains stuck there. So uh, what is, uh, in your opinion, uh, in your experience, uh, the prodigy that needs, uh, that could happen whereby uh, the P5 were removed from their status and became normal actors uh, as everybody else? Uh, how do you go about this? How would you go about this if you were the Secretary General, which is uh, uh, something I hope would happen? <laughs> After uh, enough of Men. white, uh, yes, white uh, uh, senior white males, the last no? so, I am a senior white male, and I've had enough <laughs> of senior white males uh, pretty much everywhere. <laughs> so I hope uh, a woman will take over as the then the Secretary General finally when Guterres is done. Please. I think I believe strongly that. The UN is as strong as its member states, mm -hmm. because as an institution, it's the member states that drive it. Yes, the Secretary General has a serious role. There's a role to lobby, there's a role to move, do all kinds of things. And when the P5 was formed, as I indicated earlier, there were very, many countries had not formed their strength. The wealth in the world, wasn't as strong as it is today. I believe that if all of the nations, the rest of the world came together and said, it's time for us to dismantle this structure, it's time. I don't think, and because I'm here, I would say this, I don't think the Italians are dependent on any of the five permanent members, like maybe in time past. Today, they have a strong economy, they can stand their own. I don't think Sweden, I don't think Israel, all of the different places in the world with all of the strength and wealth they possess should continue to sit and say, let these five people run the security of our world as it is. That is the key problem. So I think what we need is one bold global leader to start a kind of mobilization supported by a very strong secretary general who will say, I support you. Let's go to a conference. Let's dismantle 
the five permanent members, and let's take it as everyone else, and let's see how our world will go. And I think if you have a leader, say in the US, who is understanding, who is progressive, I know no one wants to leave power, but with an understanding that billions of dollars are spent every year trying to end wars. And billions of dollars are spent every year by groups saying, oh, we want to empower smaller nations. But empowering smaller nations is not just in saying, it's in doing. And empowerment is not just giving money. Empowerment is taking a step back, giving up some of your power so that others can have it. And I think if those five members are really serious about global peace in this world, one person in that group just need to decide, we don't need this burden anymore. Let's mobilize different groups. But I think it's gonna take one bold leader of our world to start that conversation. And once it happens, I think we'll be at a better place. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I hope so. But uh, I see you as a good candidate. <laughs> you know, it's uh, you know there is a principle, non written principle, whereby only smaller counties uh, mm -hmm. can produce a secretary general. So you're perfectly fit. Okay, more questions? Yes. Um, you were talking earlier about um, the Niger Delta. Do you? I was. I was interested. Um, I don't. Uh, I don't know a ton about your work. I mean, you told us a little bit about it today. But do you think that tackling the problems of um, of people and women in those situations, so building hospitals or or helping people get off drugs, things like that, do you think that that would be a better mode of action than than the militarization that happens? Do you think that, that would actually help them first? One of the first times the Niger Delta was um, featured. It was when the women seized the compound of Shell and they surrounded that building and said, we will take you all hostages. We'll take hostages until our children can benefit from the fruits of the oil that belongs to us. If this room was a country and I walked in here and we all could coexist with respect and dignity. There will be no dissension. Everyone, we will. But if I came in this room and said, I must be the only person to walk with shoes, regardless of the season in the world, I must be the only person to eat and drink and do everything else. And each and every one of you have to sit and watch me. It will progress for a while, but eventually one person will rise up and decide that. Everyone wants to live in dignity. Go and research the Niger Delta. CNN just did, I think last year or two years ago, another documentary on one of the, the on the oil rich area with the pirates and, and, and the, 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 the guys who are going around kidnapping people. See where they live. You know, see how these people live in, in those communities. Yes, they form things called the Niger Delta Development Committee, where millions of dollars are given to different groups in the government to say, let's have this development. And of course, corruption is also key. So my take would be sign a contract with the people and implement the projects yourself. One of the best roads we have in Liberia is a road that was done by the Japanese. They signed a contract with the government and brought in their own engineers, knowing that if we give this money, there is a high chance that it would not be used for the purpose with which it was intended. So sometimes it's almost like going to the river to get water and using a, a basin that has a lot of hole in it. You've tried one thing and you keep trying and keep trying and keep trying, it's not working. Try something else, you know? So I think, but if every young person could envision themselves 
in school, in university, sitting in an office working, could see that my child is born and they, there will be absolutely zero reason for taking up guns. And the example that I gave all of the time, why don't the youth in this country pick up arms? Why are you, the young people of this country, the young people in Sweden, Germany, all of these places, because their basic human security needs are being met. In Norway, there is oil and gas, and there is plenty for the people. I'm not saying there are not poor people in Norway, but the poverty is not at an extent where there is a drive to pick up arms to kill someone. That's my point. I have one question. Um, we have seen that several Nobel Peace Prize winners uh, who are women have won the Nobel Peace Prize also because of their uh, negotiations capacity in uh, peace building and in uh, war and conflicts. So uh, what do you think about the role of women in the negotiations tables? Because we haven't seen uh, women so far giving their voice, for example, in this situation in Ukraine. We haven't seen them on these negotiation tables um, that failed, of course. You know, it makes me very mad when people say we haven't seen the voices of women in these spaces. And I'm mad because it projects lack of intelligence, lack of ability, which is not the case. There are many intelligent women, many capable women who can serve as mediators. But we continue to talk about structures and systems that disempower a group of people. And this is a conversation, I have survived war. The war started when I was 17, I'm 50. That's how many years ago? 33 years ago, when, when Liberia went to war, and I'm a survivor of that war. But the conversation of women's involvement has been happening for the last 33 years, as I know it. But if you go back to the conference that the women had in the Hague in the 1900s, that was the same conversation. Why are women not involved? And if you look at and go deep into the Ukraine today, who are the first responders for peace? The women. If you go to Afghanistan today, the women are the ones in the community picking up the broken pieces, starting wounds, finding food. That is a form of peace. They try to bring the first sense and sensibility to a community when something happened. Where does the problem lie? The problem lies with when people come in to do that first peace mission, like in the Ukraine, the first peace mission that has taken place has had zero women. So it's already laying the foundation for the exclusion of women. The talks in Turkey, did you see the pictures? All men in suits. And this has been happening for hundreds of years. Meanwhile, as the, these talks and these negotiations and these conversations are happening, it is the women who are waking up in the morning, clearing the debris of the explosion, looking for food for their families, trying to tend to the sick, which is, a form of peace. So until we move from that place of leaving women, or in, 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 in 1999, Elizabeth Wren and Ellen Johnson certainly did a book called Women, War, and Peace. And that's when UN Women was um, unifying. And when they did that book, or 2000, Women, War, and Peace, check it out on the web. One of the conclusions of their study was that the impact of women's life, the impact of conflict on women's lives 
is a reflection of the interaction during peace time. Let's unpack that statement for a moment. If in a community, in a society, women are taken to be nothing, their bodies is projected more than their intellectual ability. In a period of war, those women will be treated just as they were treated in peacetime. If there was no system for domestic violence, for the abuse of women in peacetime during war, you see an increase in rape, you see an increase in all of the different things. After war, everything that is done is RE, rehabilitation, reconstruction, reconciliation, all of them. So the RE is we're redoing everything. And if the first step to redoing everything, which is the pre-mission assessment, women are left out. It means that you're redoing, not in a new way, but in the old way. So yes, women, we, we can't leave here, we can't continue to make a case but it is necessary for us to keep raising our voices, even with the UN Security Council Resolution 1325, participation, prevention, protection. We still have this situation of no women being involved in some of these conversations. How do we fix that? I don't know, because women have stormed these halls. When the Syrian talk was happening in Geneva years ago, the women arrived and the police were positioned. And what the government does very efficiently in Syria is to counter all of the advocates of women's involvement with women. So there were women there with stones throwing at the women who are advocating for women to be at the table. So over time, the, the, the masters have mastered a game of division, knowing that when women sit at the table, they will bring a lot of sense and sensibility. And this answers the question of, are women more peaceful than men? I don't think so. I think women are more thoughtful. Mm -hmm. It's more about the community. It's more about schools and healthcare facilities. With the men, it's more about the power and the jobs. Yeah, yeah, this is a very interesting uh, discussion philosophically. Uh, I agree with you up to a certain point. I think uh, women are uh, more peaceful than men uh, because they care uh, about the basic needs. They care more. They're more focused uh, on practical issues. Uh, men pursue ideologies. They are in the past. Uh, but women are more focused on uh, survival, basic issues, uh, no matter who they are, young, old, uh, uh, literate, illiterate. Uh, their focus is on uh, basic issues and therefore they are less uh, prone uh, to destruction. Uh, I am uh, persuaded of it. Uh, from experience and from you know, reading. And, uh, so it's a high time for, for women. I think if a woman made it to the uh, UN, uh, many things could change. Not everything, but many things could, could change in various respects. But of course, if you count that uh, all three uh, monotheistic religions uh, are absolutely male oriented. Uh, it's a big deal. Mm. It's a big deal. In all respects. Yes, Julia, you have objections to, to what I said? No, I, I wanted to apologize for arriving late. I was registered online and didn't realize you were going to be here in person. And I um, actually attended the Noble Peace Forest Summit at the auditorium a few years ago. And this is a dream come true for me. I mean, I have so many questions, but my heart is racing and they're all not coming to me. When Please you tell your heart to calm down because I'll run away in a few minutes. So <laughs> ask your question, my darling. I was asking 
actually remembering that, uh, I hope not to misquote you, but during that conference, you actually said, uh, you're talking about disarmament and how at times uh, when you were out on the streets with other women, uh, I think you made a joke uh, about how you actually had access, you actually had arms. At times you would have wanted to take those and actually shoot people. Um, so I, I politely disagree, I think, Women can also feel very angry and uh, that thoughtfulness. And I that, didn't say they wouldn't be angry. Uh, peaceful. <laughs> but but I, I tell you one thing, uh, my dear. Everyone, and that's the reason why I made this statement that I made that are we more peaceful than men? I don't want to say yes, we're more peaceful. Because in all of us, we all carry demons and angels. Um, we all carry, the way I describe it is we, we carry, each and every one of us carry a degree of anger, a good amount of anger. But, and when I teach to young people, I have a bottle of water and I have two cups. So just imagine we have a bottle of water and two cups. And in that bottle, is a bottle filled with anger and the bottle represents each and every one of us in this room. The cup in front of us represents violence and nonviolence. And the fuel for transformation or for destruction is the anger that we carry. And when we decide where to pour it is the legacy that we leave. So for most times, women would decide I'm pouring my anger into the nonviolent container. And that, that anger that is poured into the nonviolent container is, is, it comes out as helping to rebuild schools and catering to the needs of the sick and being more thoughtful about justice issue, all of that. And some men do the same. The anger that most people who fight, who start wars, pour into a violent container, because for them, I'm so angry and I just want to destroy stuff, you know? So we all carry it, but it is where we put it. King was an angry man. Gandhi was an angry man. Mandela was angry. Rosa Parks was angry. I tell people I'm not an angry woman sitting right here. <laughs> you know, we all carry a degree of anger. But it is that anger that drives us. I remember the day Russia attacked Ukraine. I was in Dubai for a meeting. And I don't watch the news. I don't like to watch the news but I watch the news because it's necessary for the work that I do. And that morning I, I kept, and my faith is important to me, so I was praying and saying, why? But I was really very angry. And I went downstairs and we're doing big media. And I literally forgot that I was surrounded by press people. And someone said, did you see the news? And I was like, I, I just asked God, why can't he just take Putin down? And everyone turned <laughs> and looked at me. And I was like, oh, you did not just hear that from me. <laughs> you know, but fortunately for me, well done. <laughs> the press wasn't interested in a quote like that. Because people in that room were all like, what the hell just happened to our world? One or two of them whispered to me, that's exactly how I feel. You know, and later on in the day, I have a son who's 25, almost 26, and he, some days he helps me process stuff. And I was talking to him and he said, you know, because of our faith, it's not for us to ask God to take someone down. Mm -hmm. You know, and he went on and on and I said, yeah, I know, but it was in the moment of just being angry. You know, 
But each and every one of us carry that within us. Yeah. Maybe not ask a God, but suggest. That. <laughs> <laughs> Since then, I've been in rooms where I've heard work and it made me to feel like, okay, yours was not that bad. <laughs> Any other question? We have a few minutes more. Great, uh, we have questions. Um, um, to be honest, I actually just kind of have a comment to be the structure. And I wanted to point out that um, you mentioned about how we should come together as one because we are a global community. And all of um, all of our nations are in their like we have in our best interest to find global peace. But at the same time, I think we have to take into account from what we're seeing, which are now called human greed and how what's the best word? Uh, ambition in the worst way possible to ruin that, and how uh, the hierarchy of uh, let's say like different ideologies could also ruin. That um, this necessity that we do have in keeping global peace. So, like, to what extent is that achievable in being here in this first? Country? I mean, one of the things that we have to look at, and because you're from my region of the world, let's talk about the EU. Mm -hmm. When do we become, when, or when does leaders? become honest with each other. When, how can President Maki Sal, who is now chair of the AU, say to Abe of Ethiopia that you're wrong without fearing that or without having any care that Ethiopia may say, take the EU out of my capital city. You understand what I'm saying? Or when would nations, because recently and in a few weeks we'll go to Durban and that is if we can go to Durban because of the rains now you've seen what happened in South Africa recently. Um, how can we come together as a continent to say the child labor, they're about what? The, since COVID, the number has increased to about 120 million plus. I hope I have the figure right. But at least 80% of the increase is from our continent. So how can we come together? Kalash Satyati, who's Indian, along with myself, has been leading the charge. We managed to get the AU to put it on their agenda. But again, is that where it's going to stop? Go ahead, Mama. But then, yeah, we also have, when we have leaders trying to come together and create like a more pan Africanist movement, we see a lot of efforts from the West world and the Europe or the United States trying to in some way um, crash like those type of, uh, break those, those type of attempts. Like you know, we've seen that uh, this might become controversial, but with Badaki too, we've seen that in um, Rwanda too, we've seen that in a lot of other places in Africa. So, and, and, and it's true, but, there is no but to that statement. It's very true. However, the hope that is that eventually we will have leaders who will be more inward focused rather than being focused on um, getting invited to the White House, to different places. Because I'll give an example. And for me, that is my drive. My drive is, I don't have money. I don't have power as in, but I have my voice. And I tell myself, if I'm ever put into a meaningful space, 
I will use my voice to speak up against the ills. So a few years ago, I was in a room with very powerful men, like the professor mentioned, white men with a lot of power. Senior. Senior white men. And around that table, they, they, these are people who I know are in endless of our leaders. And they sit at that table and start to condemn a continent loaded with corruption, blah, 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 and they go on and on. And every African person around that table is silent and nodding. I raised my hand and I asked one of the senior white men, are you not the problem? Mm -hmm. Good job. And he was taken aback, and you could hear the gaps in, in the room. I said, sir, are you not the problem? When your leaders invite our very corrupt leaders to your palaces, entertain them, bring your media, shake their hands and tell them they're doing a great job. Are you not enabling corruption? And you want the poor people to rise up and die when you also have some power to say, because you are corrupt and you are not doing good by your people, I am not inviting you to share a meal with, with, with me. When you invite them, maybe you all don't know it, by standing and having photo ops with them, walking with them in your palaces, you are telling them to tell us that you endorse their corruption. No one could talk. And I said to him, sir, for the record, you served breakfast in this room this morning. I did not eat. So I don't want you to think that I'm Phil. That's why I'm disrespecting you. I'm as hungry as I can, and I'll leave hungry. But that is the situation <coughs> of the world that we live in. <coughs> so everyone has a role. And when we talk about collaborative, when I talk about collaborative efforts, people on the ground can do their work, but leaders of global nations in the world need to begin to say. And if one person I've seen do that recently was Biden. When he had his Africa summit online, he invited a lot of people. And I'm watching to see this year, when it happens again, that this year is going to be in person but they will only invite in person countries that have good human rights record and their accountability records are good. I want to see who all he will invite. Great, excellent. There is uh, time for a last question. Would you like to ask it by any chance? <laughs> um, so I would like to like, as a girl who was raised and was born in a, a more social state, um, um, I would like to know like what what, what can I do like for, for like how can I contribute to global peace? So yeah, like a lot of things going on in my country. So like two two days ago, like there was a tree explosion in the school, and like we lost 120 insects kids they were like just a school student so yeah i don't know like <laughs> i'm studying but um yeah I was like, I, I, you know when people think about global peace and think about impacting the world we all think one of the things that our world has lost is the understanding of our collective humanity. When Trump put the ban on the Muslims, I was in the US lecturing at a university. A lot of the students were at the airports with placards. That's their Im image of doing something, which was good, laudable. That evening, Oh, that school had 
more immigrant students. So that evening we went to a lecture and I asked the immigrant students to stand like yourself. And then they sat and I asked the students who went to protest that morning to stand. And I asked the immigrant students to stand again. How many of you immigrant students have been invited to the dorm room of any of those who went to protest? A vast majority of those immigrant students who the students were protesting have never been spoken to by any of those students. But they felt it was important to go and protest, which is good, don't get me wrong. But how do you protest for someone's rights when that person walks past you every day and you've never once stopped to ask them, where are you from? You've never once stopped to make them to feel welcome. You never once ask them, how is this policy hurting you? I see you are from X country. What can you do? Create communities, smile, give people hope, even as you do your activism, make your space bright. I'll tell you a story again. I was in grad school and the first day I got to grad school, we had, I lost my sister. So we protested, we ended on a high, we elected Africa's first female president. And then I left and went to grad school. But before going, I lost my sister a month before. So I was still in my mourning period. Then I get to grad school and I'm walking one day and I meet two black men, one from Uganda, one from Rwanda. And they were like, oh, my sister, we are hungry. I say, how are you hungry? There's the cafeteria and they say, are we good to eat grass? They're talking about the salad and everything. We want real food. So I said, okay, I'll take you off. I'll come to your house, take you shopping and teach you how to cook. I went to the apartment, taught them to cook. Long story short, it was a useless venture because they were not learning how to cook. <laughs> so I started cooking on campus and I'll leave my key at a permanent place and everyone knew where to find the key, but they would come and eat. One room, wash your plate, clean up after yourself. There was a young, so eventually it wasn't just African students, it was Israeli, Palestinians, Afghanistan, but there was one student who was a Fulbright scholar. And one from Indonesia who started calling me mother of peace on campus. This is way before the Nobel. And so one day someone came, this student from Afghanistan became my son. He had just come from his village to a college in the US to do his masters, he knew nothing about anything. So a friend of mine told me how he came late to class every day because no one would wake him up. He, like he would sleep through his alarm. So I started calling him in the morning and say, you have to wake up. So I became his alarm. And then one day he had a car. I didn't have a car. I was self-supported. All of them were full bright scholars. So I used to call them full bright and they'll call me empty bright. Mm -hmm. So one day he, he was driving me to go and buy food. And then he said, mother of peace, do you know that? I've never had a birthday cake in my life. I said, really? He said, yes. I said, okay. I said, why? He said, that thing people do, party, party, it was never done for me. So I went to the school and asked just for them to give me his birthday. And it was just around the corner. So one afternoon, I said to him, take me to Walmart. He took me. I went in, I bought stuff. And then he, we took it home. He asked me, when is the class? I said, class is 10 minutes late tomorrow because I wanted to decorate the classroom. 
Long story short, we had his first birthday party. And till today, most of our mates from that program will say, if that touched them to the core, and I tell this story not to elevate myself, but to tell you that sometimes in our world, when we give someone hope, we create peace. When we show someone that we see them as humans, we walk by a lot of people during the day, but we don't see a lot of people. But when you, in, when you make someone to know that you've seen them, you create peace. So whilst you may be writing letters to do activism, advocacy, find moments to volunteer in this community, find moments to reach out to people, find moments to read to a child, find moments to do something, because it is by helping that we get helped. And it is by helping others to be healed that we also experience healing. Thank you all.